Hey guys, hi. I'm Vasco, I'm co-founder and CEO of Unbabel. Uh, as we were introduced, what we do is we combine artificial intelligence with a crowd of humans to deliver translation at scale. And we use that to enable customer service to happen in 28 languages. Um, we have been around for a few years. Uh, we are in Y Combinator in 2014. Uh, we're about 250 people now in uh, offices here in Lisbon, in San Francisco, in Pittsburgh, and New York. Uh, and we raised 91 million so far, and the latest round has been Series C. It's been quite a bit of growth in the last five years. And what I want to talk about today is actually how do you keep innovating in a company that is fast growing when there is so much pressure to just focus on your core business model? And so I, I think that's one of the key challenges of every scale up, right? You start out and you have this vision of how the world should be. And you start out with a lot of possibility. This was the case for us. Uh, if you think about translation, you can apply translation to a number of different things, right? From, you know, what we're doing right now, customer service, but also marketing text or, you know, websites or medical stuff or legal stuff. There's all of these possibilities. And a lot of stuff in the beginning, a lot of effort is on finding that one initial beachhead, that one initial focus that will enable you to scale and to create things that are processes, processes and an engine that enables you to grow. And typically to do that, you need to actually go smaller and smaller, right? You need to focus on what is the minimal thing that creates value in the market that you can optimize to a degree that you can then scale. But that, that's just the beginning, right? Because once you find that, you found your engine of growth. You found that one thing that you can keep doing and getting bigger. And a lot of times, you know, that is actually quite sufficient to become a big company. But the problem is that you run the risk of um, getting stuck in a local maximum, right? Of finding that one thing that, even though it's successful, it's going to lead to a mid-sized company, which is not really fulfilling the vision that you started with. And on top of that, you have your investors, your team, really also striving and, and encouraging you and demanding sometimes that you focus relentlessly on that one thing that made you successful so far. And so the question is, if you're going to continue to innovate, if you're going to continue to find other products that are going to continue to help you climb that, you know, get out of that local maximum and find new avenues of growth, how do you do that inside your organization? And so that, that's been the thing that has been driving, driving me a lot from the beginning. So I, I have a PhD in natural language processing. I'm from Carnegie Mellon. Research has been at the, at the core of Unbabel since the beginning. My co-founder also has a PhD in machine learning. From the beginning, we felt that there were a lot of unanswered questions in what we're trying to solve. You know, you might think, you know, if you use Google Translate, that translation is a solved thing. But actually, it's, that's very far from the truth. Not only translation as a whole, uh, you know, especially for domain-specific things is very much unsolved, but solving language as a problem is very close to solving intelligence in general. And so we had this, this innate um, drive to continue to research fundamental problems. Now, I think that's where, as a CEO, as a founder, you can make a difference. It's very hard for someone inside an organization, even as a startup, to drive new initiatives that are disconnected from the general strategy of the company. Because, you know, as a leadership team level, or as a CEO, or as a board level, you set the strategies. You say, hey, we're going after this market, and everybody needs to row in the same direction. And so if there's someone in your organization that says, hey, actually, there's this other thing next to here that I want to, you know, do, it's very hard for that person to drive that, that change. And so that is very much something that the CEO or the founders have the ability to do. You know, no one for some reason um, takes to fault if a founder says, you know what, I'm going to take four or five people and go over there for a couple of months and work on this thing that maybe none of you is right now seeing the, 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 the usefulness, but I believe that it's going to be disruptive in the kinds of things that we're doing. 
And so that, that for me was lesson number one is that it's up to the founders, it's up to the CEO to invest in that continuous engine of change even inside the organization. And for us, that's what we did. So we, um, uh, we uh, created what we call the labs team inside Unbabel. And that team reported to me, especially in initial stages. The labs team was different from every other team at Unbabel. The labs team was not responsible to deliver results on a quarterly basis. They had much more autonomy to pursue what we called moonshots, um, different ideas that ranged from things that they expected to have a return the next two months to things that could be long term and maybe were pointing us in the direction in the next two years. Um, a lot of times that team was not understood and that's something that we saw from the beginning, which was there is a, some time, uh, I think a healthy um, tension inside the company where the labs team is coming and saying, hey, here's this thing that we want to work on, while the rest of the company is going, wait, but if everybody is pointing this direction, can't we use these resources to go faster in the direction we're already going? And it's really up to the CEO to be able to stick with that labs team and to carve out a sandbox, you know, and even though you're saying, hey, there's a limited amount of resources that we're going to apply to this, maybe 5% of our resources, 10% of our resources max, but within that sandbox, we're going to be able to expand and to experiment in different ways. The other thing is, this team needs to have a license to fail, right? I mean, there's going to be at least 50% of the ideas that are not going to be successful. They're going to try things sometimes that even you don't necessarily agree with. For us, for example, so we, our core product when we started was translating emails. We can do this really fast and in incredibly high quality. And then you can in turn use this translation of emails to enable different processes inside companies. So for example, uh, if you want to enable customer service via email, so you know, uh, contact centers, suddenly you can do it in a bunch of languages. Or if you want to do internal communications, or if you want to sell stuff through email. So there's all of these use cases that all use the same method of, hey, give me an email, I'll give you a translation in five minutes or less. Now, at the time, for example, Lab said, you know what, we actually think that it's possible to go after chat. And for us, chat was a problem because chat was realistically pretty much real time, right? I mean, no one is going to wait five minutes for a response on a chat message. And even I at the time, you know, you know and I think I'm a fairly open-minded uh, person, felt that there is no way we're going to be able to do that. That seems like a lost cause. But Labs had the autonomy to say, I respect your opinion, but give me time to prove you wrong, right? And they kept pursuing this. And now the chat product represents 30% of our revenue. This in the, next two, in the last two years. So it was very interesting to see how not only you need to give autonomy, but you have to have a leader of that team that is able to stand up sometimes to the founders, to the CEO and say, hey, I believe in this, this is gonna work, give me some time to prove you wrong. Without it, you're gonna end up cutting bait too early and not let, giving time for that team to really achieve the potential of the ideas that they're developing. And so I think the, a very important part of every startup that is dealing with you know, any technology that they believe has the potential to change the world is to aim for the impossible. But the problem is that every time you achieve one more step in that path to the impossible, you then become attached to what you've done already and you're very concerned about continuing to innovate and risk because it might derail your growth path. And it's very easy to get stuck into the things you already know, right? And to just do more of those. And it's a dichotomy and sometimes um, a really hard path because you do need to do that more, right? You, I mean, if you're gonna go be a global company, you're gonna need to take the products that work and scale it across markets, you know, scale it at a global level. But you need to find structures and resources inside your company that enable you to continue to innovate and to create things that everyone thinks is impossible. That is very much the case with us. And for that, there is three things you need. So one is, as I mentioned, 
create the space, create the sandbox. We called it labs. Other companies call it something different. You can try to create, call it the moonshot team. You can create whatever you want, right? But create that space. Two, find the right people and give them autonomy. And three, keep believing in building the impossible. Thank you very much.